Praise Jesus. Gay is not sin. And Jesus isn't asking the gay person to change and be straight. You know, we're soon going to be with the Lord. He's going to return and, and a new type of life will begin. You know, this is all possible because Jesus loved you while you were yet a sinner. And by grace you are saved, not of works. Least any man boast. Now this means that you can't earn salvation because you need to pay for the price of your sin. And your sins, the smallest sin that you've ever done, will get you eternal death. You'll be thrown in the lake of fire where there'll be gnashing of teeth. The indication is that's forever and ever and ever. Now, this doesn't mean you accept Jesus so you don't have to go to this lake of fire where you'll be gnashing your teeth for basically forever. You don't choose Jesus because you will miss something terrible. Yeah, you do miss something terrible, but Jesus loved you while you were yet a sinner. And he had a book written. He inspired people to write the Bible. And you can learn about Jesus through the pages of the Bible. He's wonderful. He tells you in so many words. Uh, the Bible's pretty big. He tells you how much he loves you. And that he came to pay the price for your sin. So you wouldn't have to. Lots of people want to try to say, well, the Jews killed him. Or uh, our sins killed him. No, his love for us killed him. He came and died for us because he loved us so much and he could pay the price. We can't pay the price. We'd have to spill our blood and sure enough that pays the price but we're eternally in the lake of fire after that. Jesus was without sin. He came and he shed his blood on the cross that paid the price for your sins. So when you accept Jesus and his work on the cross. This means, when you say you accept Jesus, this means you believe God. God said, I sent my son. I gave my son. So that he would die on the cross. Because he is worthy. He is without sin. He can die on the cross and because he is without sin, he can raise again. And so this is what you, pretty much, you got to have. It's, it, it, it's not necessarily like a command or anything else. It's just kind of like a fact. you got to believe what Jesus did. you got to believe God when he says, I sent my son. That whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Part of that is that you believe God rose him on the third day. Now we have the record that Jesus lived for about 33 years. He started his main ministry uh, at about 30 years old. And there's lots of stories up to 30 years old about him. Some are in the Bible and some are in books that could have been in the Bible and some are books that banned from the Bible because those that banned it didn't want that kind of thing in the Bible where it could be very well it could have actually been in the Bible and whether God knew what he was doing no matter how he did it to get the Bible written. To hear the stories of how the Bible written, you kind of wonder how could it be the Word of God because some of the people that were instrumental in putting it together didn't seem like very good 
representative of uh, God, uh, let alone being spiritually inspired. Well, the people that wrote the Bible, the books and everything, they were the ones that were inspired. God had some people that could do it, put it in the way he wanted it. They didn't change the words of the Bible. They just put them in a concise position. God got this guy, you know, um, said to him, he, I'm going to put a cross in the sky, so this will make you think you put a cross on all your shields and you win the war. Well, he did. And so he got this idea that, wow, you know, there's a lot of power in Christianity if you use it right. And it didn't take them too long to make Christianity the main religion of the land, or the official uh, religion of the land. And he um, ordered, basically, the Catholics, uh, because this is in Rome, you know, in the Roman Empire type of deal, <clears throat> he ordered them to put together a book and do it yesterday. So here you got a group of these Catholic leaders who fighting each other, and they had that tent, tent with the ones way off yonder. You know, you had two sets of things. You know, we were in what Istanbul or something. And then you had the one in Rome, and each one wanted to be the the power head of all the church. So you had the contention between those two. But the, you have this guy telling them, you know, I want it done. And not tomorrow. And so they had to work to get the books. They had to do a lot of negotiating and deciding which is going to be put in there. And, and, and so, see, God's pretty cool. He, he says, well, you know, if I give them too much time to think about it, too many years to do it, they might never get it done. And also they might do it their way. I want it my way. So if they're a little bit rushed here, they're going to have to throw in the books in their current thinking pattern. And it'll come out the way I want it. Because in their current thinking pattern, there's a lot of books they don't want in the Bible because it represented a threat to their power. And there was lots of other kind of things because, you know, they weren't dummies. They, they kind of knew some things. And, and there are some uh, things that sounded pretty good in comparison to some other texts that was just as right in saying the same things, but it didn't have the well, what, what, what poetic sound to it. So God had his way of knowing one way or another, however it was, to get all the books in the Bible as it is today. So, what of these other books? Does that make them of non-effect? No. Just because the Catholics didn't like certain books because they didn't like them, it, it would take power from them and give power to Christians, as it were. They didn't like this kind of thing. And the Protestants, also, as time went on, became more powerful too. And, you know, they've got to be... Rome's got to somehow keep control of all Christians and, and, and of course they eventually couldn't to a degree I mean they, they still as wield control over pretty much everybody and I, I really don't think it's necessarily all that godly but God knows what he's doing he can use just about anybody to get his job done the inspired part was taken care of now you got the Bible so how it is that you think the Bible came together, the Bible is the Word of God. That's how you get to know Jesus. That's how you get a kind of a history uh, uh, of the world. It's, and it's not like a history book because it's the living Word. When you accept Jesus, this becomes the living Word. And it's dealing with things. It's dealing with your body, mind, soul and spirit, all these kind of things, whatever you want to call those things, besides the, the various nations 
and the symbolisms of what these kind of mean. The Bible is layered over itself in some places, so you're reading here, and it's not doesn't seem quite in chronicle order, but it also brings back and it fits together nicely. The Bible is pretty unique in, in the ability of what it does. The Word of God. Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Of course, we know who and lived among us. Who is that? That's Jesus. So his name basically is the Word of God. You can't take the Word of God you can't take the Bible out of Christianity. You can't say, well, I'm going to pick and choose what I want. You can't say, because I think this means this, then that can't be what God really does. So I'm not going to accept this kind of part in the Bible because it doesn't fit with what I think God might actually be. So I'm picking and choosing what I'm going to believe. You can't do that. Just because you may misinterpret something or not understand something doesn't make a verse not the Word of God because you think it means something else and so you go out and condemn a whole bunch of people because you point to a verse and you say see it's right there in the Bible God said it so I believe it just because you think that that your interpretation of it is right doesn't make it right you have 37,000 Christian denominations. They're all fine for what is the right interpretation. Many have a very common foundation. Part of the reason the Bible was written is to kind of get a uniform sense. So the leader there, um, Constantinople, I mean, uh, Constantine, rather, um, he wanted some, you can't have all kinds of scattered brain denominations out there. You've got to focus them in onto a point of reference. And so the Bible got made. And so there is a fundamental source that we call the living word. It's the Bible that you can go back and study and be approved of God. That doesn't mean your brain and all your experience and the church you went to or whatever or the church you began to hate and you went someplace else and you liked that one or something for a while and maybe went someplace else or you went to a few different kinds or whatever it is, liking the best, whatever, nothing wrong with that. Come up with the idea and your traditions in your own family and so forth and what country you might be from and, you know, Protestant, Catholic, there's all kind of reasons why you come up with the idea of something, a verse means something. But that doesn't mean it means what you think it means. Generally, there's not a much of a problem because you can, the whole Bible is made to be relatively easy to understand. But there's a lot of things that are harder to understand and those easy parts to understand actually fits into a more complex thing because God is talking about everything and that and he even says there are some people that with understanding there's some people that can figure things out hey there's people out there that can calculate that number of the beast and there's a lot of people that do all kinds of funny things to try to come up with that 666 But the bottom line is, we have the Bible, but we have other books that you can read. They're not banned by God. You can read anything you like. You got to be careful because <laughs> there's a lot of things that want to influence you to a certain way of thinking. Antichrist certainly wants you not to be hanging on to the things of God. He wants you to turn to the things of a new world order. And right now, he's not going to say, I want you to turn to me and worship me as Satan or use my original name Lucifer or whatever. He's not going to be that blunt yet. So, 
the world generally is designed to influence you to be able to accept this coming uh, organization of Antichrist, what we like to call Antichrist Kingdom or seven year tribulation period. It's kind of interesting. Um, uh, Obama had, uh, as he was talking one time, he made some statements. It's kind of interesting. You had George Bush's daddy says, a new world order. Now that's pretty blatant, and, you know. Christians say, bah, yeah, Antichrist kingdom right away. Obama gets up there, he's saying basically the same thing, but the wording is kind of cool. You know, it said something like um, this old system, political system or governmental systems is not holding together well all around the world. So we need to have a new order system that allows for uh, a different um, what's the word he used uh, structure so uh, that in other words different ideas about the world the way he said it which I had the clip to put on there was that the Antichrist kingdom is coming. Now, if you're a lot of Christians say, oh, Obama's the worst thing that there ever was. How do you get this idea? If there's a Republican in there, he would just be doing the same thing slightly differently that maybe be more pleasing to Republicans. But the same results is going to come out there. They're just as bad. I mean, there's some information about the the, uh, I mean, it's almost like people forgotten when past presidents was in there, Republican presidents, and what they did. Um, there's some serious, serious, serious problems that most of us don't even care about to know about our previous presidents. And it's, you know, it seems like everybody wants a, at least Christian that preaches on t TV. Certainly, they're almost like, um, what are you going to say? Muslims absolutely think that Israel's got to go. And Republicans, it just seems like they, they just think Democrats has got to go. What kind of world is this? Does this is this a Christian world? Oh, we're founded on Christian principles. Are we? Sometimes people get in there and they ask some really good evidence and really good quotations from past leaders and everything, and it sounds so really good. But when you dig into it and find out what's going on, there is an exactness to when people came over to the United States. I'm in America. There was a race, for instance, between the various religions, you know, Protestant, Catholics, and uh, Mason to get to the place where the Washington Monument is. They wanted to own it because they thought it was some sacred spot, a holy spot. It's called Holy Latitude or something like that, or Longitude. Egypt knew it a thousand years before where this spot was. Well, the Masons won. They got to own where the Washington Monument is. So the Protestants, Catholic didn't win that spot. And we can trace the background of the direction that they want to go. There's a per, per, you know, so, oh, this is a godly country. Well, yeah, and a lot of other countries are pretty godly, too. I mean, it's kind of funny that we think that we have all of this fantastic, wonderful thing that we're the best, considered as, for instance, for Christians and stuff, but we're not. 
And there's other countries that seem to be far more Christian than we are. But we don't necessarily like their way or something. Well, why do you think your way is right? Because doesn't the Bible say if you disobey God, he'll wreak havoc on your nation? And we're seeing havoc being wrecked on our nation today. And what does many of the Christians come and speak to? They say, it's because of this group. It's because of the, oh, the immorality. This, look at all the gays, you know. This abortions are going on. No wonder all this stuff is happening. No, 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 no. That's not what God says. God says, if you obey me. He didn't say, if the heathen obey me, or unbelievers obey me, or weak Christians obey me, or people that don't know what they're doing particularly, they got to somehow figure out how to obey me. No, they said, those that are called by my name, if they obey me. So, this means when you're pointing fingers at others, you've got to remember, it's you that the Bible's talking about, about you are disobeying God. And so God is going to cause all these kind of things, what now you're saying is the United States is pretty messed up, corrupt, and it, and it seemed like it's getting worse and worse. It seemed like that Satan's got all the power in the world to come in here and turn up, you know, we're going to have a, a Antichrist kingdom and everything, but it just seemed like this is just, a, oh, it's this or the Let's pray against all these other groups. And the Bible says, you need to repent. If you repent, if you begin to obey God, he'll heal your nation. Well, the tribulation is going to happen. So that means you did not obey God. Clear up to the end. It takes half of the tribulation period to get you to finally do that thing, obey me. Because God's going to not heal the land. Because he'll heal the land if Christians repent. But Christians are always out there saying, yeah, there's a lot of us that are pretty bad, but it's certainly not me. I'm warning you that you're bad. And then they also say, then they start saying, because of this, this immorality or something. It's almost like, who cares about the true terror of the world the corruption that's going on who cares about that but it boils down to the whole nine yards is it's about you and Jesus when you accepted Jesus it's going to be an eternal thing it's you and Jesus Figure that out. There's going to be help. It's going to take 1260 days to help you figure out that it's you and Jesus for eternity. It's not getting out of something. It's not what Jesus can do for you. It's a, you're his spouse. You get married to Jesus. Don't you know this marriage thing? You get married to to Jesus. That's what it's about. If you don't like that, then you're certainly not going to like the things that are going to be coming. If you want to get married to Jesus, then you can accept him right now. Say, God, I believe you gave Jesus that you sent your son to die on the cross to pay the price for my sin. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. A simple prayer like that will get you saved. As long as you keep in mind, you just got engaged to Jesus. If you understand that principle that you are engaged to Jesus, and when he comes back, you're going to get married to him. So you need to be getting your wedding gown on and ready to marry him. Because when he comes back, he's not waiting around for you to get dressed. He also has baptism of the Holy Spirit. You ask him. Now this comes in many ways. It's, it's really an unusual or kind of weird. It's a wonderful kind of thing. And, it, and 
Who knows how it will happen to you? Somebody can lay hands on you can happen. You could just be kind of mentioning that Jesus do it and it happens. You could be struggling hard, praying in your corner and all that, falling on the ground and doing everything and maybe it happens. You might struggle for years. You wonder what's going on. Or you might be not paying attention to anything and there you go, zap polo, you're down on the ground or something or you're out there babbling another language. Just ask Jesus to give you this wonderful baptism in the Holy Spirit. If you have a place of pain, touch that place right now. Healings for today. Got your hand there? In the name of Jesus, be healed. See you next week.